Right. So um, welcome all. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, to have um, Guy Hitzroni uh, give us this talk today, um, Symmetry Arguments, Methodological Equivalence and Relational Quantities. Um, so um, Guy did his PhD work with Yamima uh, ben Menachim and uh, Danny Rolich uh, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, a place I have very fond memories of myself in Itamar Petovska's time. Um, and Guy is, uh, is currently in Holland at Utrecht working with Guido uh, Bacic-Lupi and will soon be coming to Oxford and we're actually looking for face-to-face -face, um, in the not too distant future. Um, so uh, Guy, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you Simon for the kind introduction. I'm really excited and happy to talk in this uh, wonderful group. I'd also like to, uh, to take the opportunity to thank James Reed for uh, arranging uh, this uh, visit um, in, uh, in Oxford this year, and I definitely hope uh, it, will, it will become a physical visit as well soon. So the project that I'm going to describe is, um, it's uh, started actually when I was thinking about uh, the Aron of Bomb effect, and I was trying to look for more ways to think um, about the effect, about its ontology, and then I came across uh, Carlo Rovelli's paper, Why Gage, that uh, I felt it has some important hint. And um, what I'll be talking today is not about the effect, but about uh, the general uh, relationship, the way I see it between uh, symmetry arguments and uh, interactions. Um, so, I think we can, uh, there are uh, at least uh, three major ways to think about um, any symmetry. So one of them is the, um, uh, uh, before the, the, uh, what is the active and observable, to take the Galilean ship as a, um, the um, uh, exemplary um, symmetry argument and try to understand the symmetry arguments in physics um, based on a similar notion of observability. And then there, there is the approach of um, understanding symmetries as active but unobservable, for example, is, um, the notion of active deformorphisms. Um, and my view, the, the, the one that I'm going to present here is that uh, the, passive, uh, um, the passive option to understand symmetries as passive, like a coordinate transformation, like a gauge. And in a sense, it is uh, considered, especially when it comes to gauge symmetries, uh, as the mainstream option. But they'll try to present a non-standard standard angle on this, um, um, on this option. And it definitely has uh, problems that I think are good problems. So for example, uh, uh, major pro problems that uh, famously raised um, in the context of uh, general covariance is that uh, the passive view of symmetries, uh, they seem to constrain the formalism and not the physical content of theories. Um, and this point might lead to anthropocentrism if we are claiming that we are uh, learning the world through the way uh, we describe it from our perspective, as then it might lead to the view that there is something special about our perspective or that the world was meant to be studied in, in this way. Um, and there is also the problem of uh, contingency, contingency and empirical considerations, because if you're talking about uh, passive symmetries, about uh, mathematical transformations, and the question is, of course, um, what's contingent about the claim? And I think they're all good problems, and I think they're solvable, and when we try to solve them, we get to learn uh, something new. So, um, the, the outline of the talk, I'm going to start by presenting um, my view on uh, how, um, how I think uh, we could present um, passive arguments that introduce interactions um, in the most uh, passive uh, way as symmetry arguments. Um, and I think um, that this way uh, also would highlight, highlight the problem um, and then I'll try to see uh, how the problem can be solved by uh, the notion of relational quantities. And in the end, they go back to uh, step backward in a more epistemological sense to try to understand the argument better. Um, some of what I'm going to talk about uh, was published and the other 
work is work in progress. So I'm working with uh, James Street now on um, uh, the relation between gravity and the uh, and the space space time symmetries. And uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, at the end is a collaboration with uh, Noah Stemerov. Um, that we are, um, I actually doesn't agree with what I'm going to say. Uh, so we are comparing between two views of uh, the role of analogical uh, reasoning in the gauge argument. So um, um, I, will, I would like to start now with the simplest example. In general, my approach here would be to use, uh, to try to use the, um, uh, not to take the most general and most, um, uh, generalizable mathematical formalism, but uh, to do instead, just to try to stick to the simplest uh, formulation. So I'd like to start with a very simple example about uh, Newtonian gravity um, and the way it could be introduced uh, using the symmetry argument, but uh, in order to do this, we have to forget that we know about, um, about uh, Newtonian gravity. So we could uh, take the, um, the perspective, for example, of some kind of uh, alien species uh, that uh, their biology is very different from our own. They live in uh, out outer space in some kind of uh, maybe interstellar dust clouds where they have uh, there is dust and there are asteroids and the uh, small uh, rocks that uh, they can uh, play with and they're very intelligent, but they, they've never um, experienced uh, gravity. And they are very intelligent, so um, they did manage to uh, to find the, that uh, the force or the sum of the forces that is exerted on a body uh, equals uh, the mass of the body times its acceleration. And the forces here are contact forces like uh, uh, viscosity, objects uh, pushing against uh, each other, uh, friction, etc. Um, but uh, they also realized that it is only working in a certain uh, frames of reference that uh, they call them inertial frames. Um, and when they're moving to non-inertial frame of reference, when they're doing the transformation into an accelerating fr frame, then the form of the law changes and they're uh, unhappy with it. Now the story, um, the story is going to go that uh, because they're unhappy with it, they're going to do something um, similar to the gauge arguments. We'll try to restore this symmetry by introducing a new field, um, a field uh, that is, uh, can change between uh, sp space-time points, G. And uh, when they introduce this field, they uh, restore the invariance. Um, so, uh, now I would like to examine uh, if they can do it um, and how they can do it a little bit in more detail. Then the first question is why would they be unhappy with this form, with this uh, non-invariance, with this, uh, so in an accelerating frame, there is this, uh, the acceleration of the frame added to the law. So uh, they might be unhappy with it because they would think that only relative positions and velocities and accelerations should matter and uh, not absolute ones. And indeed, uh, this move would get them to the, to the space-time view, or it could get them to the space-time view that uh, Simon uh, called the vector relationism. Um, but um, so this is one possibility. But uh, in order to, to do this, uh, we have to assume that they know something about, or think they know something about the underlying ontology. So this, um, this reason for not being happy is uh, harder to generalize. I will try to suggest a more general reason for their unhappiness with this non-invariance. And this is uh, the one uh, stated by, uh, um, uh, by Einstein when he presented the, the general theory of relativity to the public in his uh, London Times paper. Uh, he said, what has nature, nature to do with our coordinate systems and their state of motions? If it is necessary for the purpose of describing nature to make use of a coordinate system arbitrarily introduced by us, then the choice of its state of motion ought to be subject to no restriction. The laws ought to be entirely independent of this choice and call it the general principle of relativity and uh, sometimes describe it as um, one step towards a general covariance. 
Um, and this is um, a slightly different reason for their uh, unhappiness. Um, but this is also problematic because it is uh, easily regarded as a constraint over the formalism, not over the physical content. And it doesn't involve any, doesn't seem to involve any contingency or um, anything that uh, he knows about uh, nature from experience. It's, um, it's a very philosophical uh, reflection. So it's uh, not very clear how it could, it could uh, lead to a physical content and to the introduction of a new force. And in a way, I will try to defend the fact that this is the core of symmetry arguments, but not by itself. Uh, like in Einstein's theory, I think that there, is, there are two uh, principles working together. And the principle that uh, in, in this example, I call it the methodological um, equivalence principle. Um, uh, I call it uh, this, this way, first of all, because, um, uh, because it resembles uh, Einstein's um, equivalence principle in the sense that it is working because acceleration and gravity do the same thing in a way. And this is the reason that it is uh, working in this case. Um, and, and the word methodological here comes to stress that uh, nevertheless it is a source, uh, some sort of a guess. Um, uh, it's uh, to guess the um, a certain way of guessing the form of the law that would satisfy the first uh, requirement. So, and uh, I would uh, like to take it and generalize it in the following way. So, the starting point is the non invariance. That's the thing that uh, disturbs those physicists. And given this non invariance under change of uh, mathematical representation, um, they're postulating an interaction and actually a field. And the interaction um, is manifested in the dynamics locally uh, the same way like the, uh, the, the non invariance. So, the non invariance implied that we're when we are moving to accelerating frame, we're having this A here. So, the field affects the same way, but uh, locally. So, it could depend on space and time. So, and of course, it has to obey the appropriate uh, transformation rule. So that means that uh, the G that, that is introduced in this way, it is not uh, just a number like the other contact forces. It depends on the frame of uh, reference. Uh, in an accelerating from frame of reference, it va its value uh, would change. Um, so uh, the two points that I would like to take from this example is first of all, the inv invariance and then and the second point is that the non-invariance, the way the change in the form of the laws uh, dictates uh, the way that the physicists guess the new interaction. And I should also mention that uh, it doesn't leave, at this point it didn't leave, uh, led them to Newtonian gravity. For example, in order to get to Newtonian gravity, we have to know that this G, uh, that it doesn't have curl, that it is a conservative force. And of course, uh, we have to uh, introduce additional principles, maybe like action reaction principle, and to find out how it is generated. Um, uh, so there is more to do, but I'm going to focus in this talk only on this part of the argument. So um, the way the law is non invariance help us to guess how to introduce the new force. And then the next example I would like to take is, um, you know, uh, in order to talk about the gauge principle is the simple case of a quantum particle. Uh, so we describe it in position basis uh, using the um, uh, position eigenstates. And then we can define the wave function. And we have the standard momentum operator and the Hamiltonian. Um, so the different representations um, that we will use are obviously in quantum mechanics different bases. And change of representations are passive unitary transformations that connect between different bases. Um, and then, because the change, we said it's going to be locally equivalent uh, to a change of representations, and we need to look at these uh, unitary transformations that are diagonal in position basis. Um, and then the wave function transform this way. And what is um, sometimes less known is that the momentum operator also transforms. Uh, we can think about the way that it transforms in a very uh, straightforward um, 
a mathematical way if the momentum operator we express it uh, using a, a, is a matrix element in position basis and we have Brian Kett then and if it's time independent it must uh, transform this way so and basically what I've written here um, it's just a uh, simple mathematics and it was known uh, by uh, Dirac that in his textbook I have this edition but I think it's actually wrote it much earlier that the momentum operator is uh, underdetermined but he said by a suitable change in the phase factors um, the function lambda can be made to vanish so that uh, the equations, the, the normal form of the momentum operator as we know it, they are made to hold. And this he called the Schrodinger representation. Now the analogy that I would like to take to make here is between this uh, Schrodinger's representation in this example and the initial inertial frame of reference in the previous example. So in order to make this analogy, um, uh, we, we, are, um, we can use the same principle. Um, so um, we could be unhappy that the law, that the Schrodinger equation is not invariant under this arbitrary change of mathematical representation. And in order to do this, we are postulating a new interaction. And this new interaction is affecting in exactly the same way um, as uh, this uh, change of representation, this mathematical change of representation is influencing the dynamics, we add something to the momentum operator, but um, um, since it is um, the equivalence is only locally, we don't have this uh, constraint. Uh, so a change of representation, you have to tell me exactly what is the face that you're adding to every point in, um, in space, to every position eigenstate. Uh, here we don't have this constraint, um, so uh, it locally looks the same, but uh, globally, of course, it's different. And then after some additional empirical input, we could identify it with the electromagnetic force, and we know that it looks like this. Then, oh, sorry, then again, um, the mathematical transformation tell us in a way how to uh, guess the form of the, in this case, the magnetic interaction. And I don't think the, that uh, uh, in more advanced uh, examples of the gauge principle that uh, they are very different. So, for example, we could take a Dirac spinor and uh, see how it changes under a local phase convention. And uh, we do the transformation. We see that uh, the Dirac equation um, we have a term added here. So, the most passive version of the argument would be to generalize it and and re, uh, interpret it or um, introduce a physical field that behaves the same and transforms according to the same transformation laws. And then we get um, the equation with new force. Of course, we have here the coupling constant that in order to, to know that we need experiments, but um, the form um, could be guessed um, based on the um, mathematical transformation. So um, I think that um, it may seem like a, a sort of a standard way or just a little bit non-standard way of presenting uh, the gauge principle. I would like now to move to an example that I think may show that it is actually more interesting um, and to see what happens when we are um, uh, thinking about general covariance in this way, what uh, John Norton called the, uh, the eight decades of uh, dispute that was almost uh, three decades ago. Um, and uh, there is still dispute. So I'm going to look at it at the perspective uh, that uh, Oliver Pooley presented um, in his, uh, in his uh, paper on another de decade of dispute. Um, and the, the example is uh, this Klein-Gordon equation and it, is, it has this uh, very simple form in, um, in a certain frame of reference. And I'm intentionally presenting it in the most uh, simple um, formalism that there is. I don't know much about uh, geometry. I don't have a metric here. So it's just a simple uh, field equation. Um, and then I'm, I would like to examine what happens when I'm uh, making a coordinate, a coordinate transformation, then what happens then is that it becomes very messy because 
And it's not surprising because this, um, this equation was written in terms of um, uh, certain uh, coordinate system in which it, it is working and then we're moving to uh, an arbitrary coordinate system that could go anyway and it, um, it becomes um, messy but this mess is basically just a partial uh, different um, partial derivatives of the coordinate uh, transformation so one thing we could uh, obviously do is say okay this problem is um, easily solvable by reformulating to the same equation in a coordinate free formulation. Uh, but um, if we do this, then according to the view that I'm suggesting, it would be like a detective that is uh, coming to the crime scene and you see a bloody fingerprint on the wall. He said, well, it is ugly, but uh, we could always uh, get a sponge and soap and clean it away. And of course, if he does it, then he misses the the clue for uh, solving the, um, uh, the crime. And I think it's uh, very similar here. So this non-invariance is a mess in troubling, but then we could um, regard it as a hint of extending the theory. So the methodological equivalence principle will tell, will tell us build a new equation in the old coordinates and introduce two terms. You, we interpret them as new physical fields that we're not in the original equation. Uh, so um, uh, these constraints uh, here at the right they only apply to the coefficients uh, that come out of the coordinate transformations. But here we could think of them as general fields as long as they transform in the right way. And uh, once I have this, um, I have the uh, Sylvester's uh, theorem that if I compare the original equation with this one, it uh, guarantees that uh, this G here, uh, it has the right uh, signature to be considered um, uh, a metric with the Minkowski met metric signature. And then um, I also have this uh, second uh, field here. Um, so here at the right, uh, uh, it was meaningless to talk about the uh, upper and the lower indices, but now that I have the metric, I can, um, talk about the upper and lower indices in the usual way. And then the, this is the equation that I get, that it is very similar to the um, uh, klein gordon equation in uh, curved space time, for example, in general relativity. But um, actually it is more general than that because uh, this G and the gamma are uh, very general. Um, so what they actually are, they could, uh, uh, they, could have be, um, they could stand for much more complicated uh, geometrical terms. If we want to interpret them geometrically, then uh, they could include uh, not only uh, curvature, but also torsion and uh, non-metricity. Um, it uh, depends on the, uh, the constraints, if there are any on gamma. So uh, this is uh, most generally clyde goron field in a metric affine gravitational gauge theory. So there are a big uh, class of them. And uh, if we choose uh, this, uh, this gamma field, if we constrain it in a certain way, we get a teleparallel gravity because there is only torsion and no curvature. And if we constrain it um, uh, to, to include only curvature and to be derived from the metric, then we get general relativity. Mm -hmm. And uh, the point, uh, I think that the interesting thing here is that I do not have to postulate in advance anything about uh, tangent spaces or uh, um, local transformations. I'm starting to with coordinate transformations and just guessing the fields um, that I get here. Now, when we're looking at this picture, I think it should um, be very, very troubling, um, not only for philosophers, because uh, here at the left-hand side, we have different mathematical representations of a certain situation. A certain, we call it the interaction-free theory. We can describe it using different mathematical conventions. But then here at the right side of the arrows, we have um, contingent, um, um, con contingent uh, facts. Like uh, for example, here, we have the equality of inertial and gravitational and passive gravitational mass. 
they didn't have to equal each other. We could think of a theory of gravity where in which uh, uh, it depends on the substance, for example. They didn't have to equal each other, but um, they equal each other. Um, and uh, those, those aliens guessed that they equal each other based on this uh, mathematical transformation. So it seems very troubling. So indeed, like many people pointed out, these kinds of arguments are not enough to, um, to retrieve the full, um, the full interaction, the full properties of the interaction, but the, the mathematics uh, through which we describe the interaction-free situation seems to know a lot, seems to know a little bit too much about how the system is going to interact with uh, something else. And I think that the um, significant parts about of the epistemological debates about uh, gauge and about symmetries um, stem from, from this point. So I would like to suggest that um, we can still uh, solve it um, still in this uh, passive view of symmetries, and the solution is based uh, on, upon um, uh, Carlo Bovelli's uh, suggestion. He said that uh, gauge invariance, I'm skipping a few words, is an indication of the relational character of uh, fundamental observables in physics. This do not refers to properties of a single entity. They refer to relational properties between entities, relative velocity, relative localization, relative orientation in internal space, and so on. Gauge interactions describe the world because nature is described in relative quantities that refer to more than one object. So I would like to um, try to connect this uh, to the um, question through a series of examples. Uh, so the most simple example um, would be the argument between uh, Newton and Mach, but um, uh, I would like to reframe the argument in terms of the uh, passive symmetries. Then the passive, um, the passive uh, version would say that if nature were only about relative positions, our theories should be invariant under arbitrary time-dependent displacements and rotations of the frame of reference. Newton saying, well, they're not invariant under these transformations. Therefore, there is more than just relative positions um, we need to formulate our series in terms of, or our series are already implicitly formulated in terms of the relation between the physical objects and another object, absolute, uh, absolute space. So um, and then my argument would be, it's not invariant under these transformations, but it would be invariant if we formulate it in terms of the relations between the water in the bucket, for example, in the uh, celestial bodies. Because um, once we formulate our theories using this uh, the, the, uh, relation between um, the, the relative position, for example, the, or the relative velocity between the water and the, all of the celestial objects, then um, this relation is invariant under passive rotations. And we automatically get this passive invariance. Now, this example, it includes rotation. It's, uh, it's more complicated, but uh, we could see it formally using this uh, simple uh, um, example. It is my version of uh, Carlo Rovelli's uh, spaceship uh, example that from the paper that I mentioned earlier. So um, we imagine a one-dimensional um, universe in which the uh, relevant dynamical variables are only the relative positions and relative velocity, relative velocities. And in this universe, the kinetic energy, it's uh, just like uh, an interaction, like an interaction that depends on the relative position. Uh, kinetic energy is an interaction that depends on the relative velocity. Um, and because it refers to two objects, and we just multiply the, their masses and divide by universal mass constant. And if the masses of all of the particles are equal to this mass constant, then this is the Lagrangian that we get. Um, but then we could also represent the same system using variables, uh, real, um, real numbers on the x-axis. So instead of uh, roughly n squared uh, relations, we could use n coordinates. 
Um, and if we substitute it, so the A is just the differences between the X's, if we substitute it and look for the equations of motion, these are the equations of motion that we get, that it's very similar to Newtonian mechanics. The difference is that every particle moves according to Newton laws of motion in a frame of reference that is defined by all other particles. So this is, uh, and this theory is constructed to be relationist uh, from the beginning. But uh, what I would like to do now is to divide, uh, before that, I would like to note that, of course, we have this uh, symmetry um, of the dynamics, and this uh, symmetry is uh, nothing um, surprising. It is just a reflection of the fact that uh, absolute positions uh, do not matter of all, at all. Um, uh, all that matters is uh, relative velo um, velocities and relative uh, positions, and they're invariant, therefore the law is invariant. Um, so in this sense, this symmetry just reflects the mathematical redundancy in the axis. But now if we divide the, uh, the universe to observable universe and everything else that uh, we denote its coordinate by X and its mass by uh, capital M, uh, it's another degree of freedom that we are not aware of, and then things would look different. So first of all, from our God's eye view, um, the law would look the same. Uh, every degree of freedom or the position of every particle the coordinate of every particle obeys Newton's laws of motion in a frame of reference that is defined by the center of mass of everything else. But then, if we have physicists here that are unaware of this, uh, the rest of the universe because of clouds or something, um, what they get um, is a different uh, law of motion. So at first they might think that the universe is just uh, Newtonian mechanics in a certain frame of reference, but if they can make very accurate measurements with uh, very high accelerations, then they will find out this uh, correction, which is unique to this universe. But they're still unaware of this X, so it is still not the most exact uh, law of motion. So here, we don't have this um, symmetry, um, obviously, because uh, the theory doesn't take into account the interaction or the, the kinetic energy, if you prefer, that is defined by this uh, external universe. Um, and this non-invariance, uh, like the aliens at the beginning, the physicists in this universe, they also they don't like it. They don't like this non-invariance. They would like to get rid of it, and not just by simple reformulation of the mathematics, they would get rid of it by um, introducing, by postulating the existence of some object that they've neglected, and instead of writing X, they would write X minus capital X. Why are they doing this? Because of the same methodological principle. This is the non-invariance. Here, lambda is just the, um, um, how the, the law is transformed under this arbitrary change of um, frame of reference. Um, and it uh, tells them how to guess the existence of a new interaction. And actually, when they do it, what they get is exactly this exact law of motion that we knew from our God's eye view. And then they could um, open the telescopes and try to find empirical evidence for the existence of this, uh, of this object. So um, and basically they're replacing um, a relation with an arbitrary mathematical um, um, background object with uh, a relation uh, with a dynamical object. Um, and if I get back to the example with which I uh, started, then here we have this relation. So I think it's a, a different form of relationism. It means that um, uh, this accelerating, uh, sorry, this inertial frame that uh, appeared in the initial laws, it, um, they guess that it is something contingent. So it's contingent and it can depend on uh, space and time. And actually, uh, true acceleration, physical acceleration is not defined with uh, respect to them or with respect to the most massive object in the vicinity. It is defined with respect to, um, <clears throat> to this uh, field that they were unaware of before. And this is what the uh, 
guess is based on. And similarly, in the momentum example, so this is a momentum in the, uh, in the Schrodinger representation in a, and then when we move to arbitrary phase convention, it becomes non-invariant. And then we get rid of it by replacing this with um, relation with um, a new physical object that is now uh, conjectured. So basically this methodological um, equivalence pr principle, it is a guess that uh, it is both a um, formal part because the theory on the right has more physical uh, contact, content and also um, um, interpretative aspect. Uh, there is something, there is another physical object that we are unaware aware of. But then the next interpretative step would be to uh, try to regard this relation as the fundamental quantity on which um, uh, which the, the fundamental quantity in the world, the, the real uh, physical quantity. So, and uh, basically this idea of invariance states that the laws of physics should depend on the relation between fundamental physical objects and not on the relations of physical objects to fixed mathematical frames of reference. Now, I would like now to get more in depth to the second question of why is this methodological equivalence working? Because I think that there is the, the problem that uh, I mentioned before in this step is not uh, yet fully uh, fully resolved. Um, and the, the, the first question that uh, I think we should ask uh, from an epistemological point of view is what kind of uh, argument is this? So it's obviously non, uh, not a deductive argument. There is no mathematical necessity to move from here to here. But it's also not, doesn't look like an inductive argument because it's based on mathematics and mathematical transformation. So it's uh, something uh, um, something uh, that uh, uh, very different than um, um, uh, arguments that the ways are usually formulated in the philosophy of science. I would like to suggest, first of all, that uh, the, to understand at least the way physicists usually present them as mathematical analogies, um, this um, this suggestion. Um, came uh, from uh, uh, Mark Steiner, philosopher, that uh, talked a lot about the mathematical analogies. So um, it's an analogy which goes through the mathematics in the sense that we can describe within the Erwinkowski space-time, we can give it several, uh, many mathematical descriptions, and they're somehow analogous to the different possible settings of the gravitational field and the possible local phase conventions are somehow analogous, but not identical to, of course, uh, different settings of the electromagnetic interactions. And uh, we could extend it uh, to other gauge series, uh, different local uh, isospin conventions are somehow analogous to uh, different configurations of the Young-Mills uh, field. So, but uh, these mathematical analogies are, uh, I think they are still problematic. If we would like to be a naturalist and empiricist, as I think we should, um, it's unclear why would the mathematics allow us to make such good, uh, to make these analogy, analogies in a way that uh, works so uh, well. And then the second question is uh, the horizontal arrows. Um, why would the systems are very different from each other. This is gravitational force, electromagnetic force, nuclear force. Why would they behave to the in the same way or uh, adhere to the same principles? So I think that the, what I like about um, the relational quantities answer is that it has the, the right degree of contingency, in my view, to account for the horizontal arrows. So 
they have something in, in common, but it's not the same physics, but it's something about the same structure, which is why we have, uh, we have uh, using mathematics that looks similar in the different cases. But I think that the vertical arrows, we need some um, further re-examination. So I mentioned them as analogies. So if we would like to um, uh, to understand them better and to um, to uh, take a naturalist commitment, then this is another uh, very minimalist version of analogies. Uh, John Norton recently presented as the material theory of indu induction, and which he identifies the analog analogical reasoning as it, it could be potentially problematic. Um, so when we make analogies, we should um, we should show how they work in terms of uh, facts in the in the world. So every fact fact of analogies in a, of analogy. So of course it's best if we could uh, observe it. But since we're talking about uh, modern uh, physics and uh, abstract entities and uh, unobservable entities. So um, I, maybe we cannot always um, observe things, um, but um, we'll have to do with, uh, con we may have to do with conjecture. And then it's, it has to be really clear how the analogical inference is based on the fact of analogy. So, um, So let us uh, go back to these uh, three cases. So uh, um, and now I'm trying to understand the vertical arrows. Mm, so the question is, can we identify any fact in the world that makes this analogy work? And I think we can. I think that the, um, uh, that the fact in the world that makes this analogy work is the existence of the gauge field. So this may sound strange because the gauge field, it's only part of the series of interaction right here at the bottom. It doesn't appear in the series up above. But if we take the relationist view, then actually um, uh, there may not uh, be such a thing as a really interaction-free theory. For example, take the gravitational case. If we say that the gravitational field the G that I introduced before is zero, it will only be true in a certain frame of reference. In other uh, accelerating frame of reference, it would have a different vol value. And actually the interaction free um, the, in an infinite universe, uh, in a sense, by the way. But the point is that, um, that the parallel of interaction free theory, or this theory becomes true, um, in a certain coordinate system in a unif uniform gravitational field. So the gravitational field was already here at first place and it was defining this preferred frame of reference. So um, the, I would like to suggest to see the, the fact of analogy that makes the argument work as the existence of some object that is represented by the gauge field. In the theory of interaction, it uh, plays an active role, it interacts. In the interaction-free theory, it is um, its role. Uh, we don't know about it, but this it is the reason that in these uh, theories, in these theories, we have preferred frame of uh, or preferred mathematical representation. Um, and then we have the analogical inference in which we introduce this uh, relation. So. I think that the problem that we are facing when we are moving from the series, interaction-free series up above to the series of interaction here below is uh, if we accept this relationist view, then what we need to do is to construct a variable, a new variable that um, is a relation between the system we were describing so far and something else. And we do it by looking at the way the preferred representation relates to other representations. And it makes sense if we remember 
the first point that this preferred representation, um, it's, a, it's actually a description of this object that we didn't know about, this gravitational field or this uh, electromagnetic field or this young Mills field that was not taken into account in the original theory. So if it represents it, then um, the way it relates to other um, possible states that actually describe the system um, would make sense uh, to see it as a relation between the system that we describe here in the arbitrary representation and the additional object. That, um, that uh, makes the preferred representation be preferred. So let me uh, conclude here just by stressing um, the important point. So the first point is um, that I think that symmetries in a sense do reflect just a mathematical redundancy. This just is an ontolo ontological sense. From, from God's eyes view, the symmetries that I was referring to, uh, as it, they do not exist. God will not see, um, will not see them. They seem to be in the formalism. But um, um, so what they actually reflect, they reflect uh, the, the, the indifference of the laws of nature to our choice of uh, representation. Um, and how do symmetry arguments work? Well, they work very often the debate or the discussion about this question ask why invariance, why we should have invariant theories. But from this view, invariance is something very natural. And what we should actually ask is, why is the theory that we have at hand not invariant? And then when we ask this um, question, well, the answer that we reveal here is that uh, we just didn't take into account um, something that we should have taken into account, something that influences the system and um, uh, creates a preferred mathematical representation that is only preferred because we don't know the whole story. And then the uh, last point is about um, symmetries as a guide to reality um, that people often say that. So I think it's um, in a sense, uh, in a sense, I agree that it is correct because um, it's correct, of course, to gather with empirical input. We can, the, it, the argument depends on which symmetries uh, we put in. Uh, so it's actually, um, and this, it, it's not clear from the beginning which mathematical transformation um, we should regard as a transformation between equiv equivalent mathematical representation. Uh, what, what stands for um, just a change of uh, representation and no more. Um, so if the argument works and if the argument gets us to a valid theory, then that means that um, the mathematical transformation from which we started uh, is indeed, it connects equivalent representations. So in this sense, it is a guide to, to ontology because it, help, it helps us to, um, <clears throat> to address the, what, what is represented and to distinguish it from properties of uh, the mathematics that, uh, that represent it. Um, so I hope, um, I hope it's clear. I think I'll stop here and uh, move into the discussion. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Gary. Thanks everybody for, uh, for listening. Yes, Th thank you for the um, presentation.